my pleasure to introduce um, uh, our next speaker, Dan Roy from the University of Toronto. He's going to give us a question. All right, so good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, so the very high-level outline of this talk is I'm going to give you a simple story about how probabilistic programming automates Bayesian inference, and then I'll complicate that story somewhat and uh, let you in on some of the things we're working on, me and colleagues, uh, <clears throat> trying to close the gap between the simple story and reality. <clears throat> so probabilistic programming has maybe two key ideas, at least from the perspective of, of the simple story. One is that we can represent probability distributions by, not by formulas, but by programs that generate samples. And that, that, that's a formal representation. So that shouldn't surprise maybe people in this audience. <clears throat> and then the second key idea is that we can build generic algorithms for probabilistic conditioning that take as input these types of representations, so code uh, describing distributions. Now the other set of key ideas that come into play here when you say apply probabilistic programming to machine learning and AI and statistics um, are Bayesian statistical ideas. And maybe probabilistic programming is more general than that in the beyond the simple story, but I'll focus on its applications to Bayesian analysis. So in Bayesian statistics, there are two key ideas, I'd say. One is that you can express statistical assumptions via probability distributions. So you have some uh, data. Is that steady enough there? You have some data, uh, and you want to make inference about some parameters that might have. It did move a little bit. It did move a little bit. OK. Sorry, <laughs> too much coffee. Um, you have some data. You want to make some inference about some parameters. Roughly speaking, there's some hidden state of nature that gave rise to, say, causally or otherwise, to your data. And you'd like to make some inference about that. But you don't, you don't, these are, these are uh, the parameters you don't get to see. Now, the Bayesian approach to this problem is you uh, produce a, uh, a distribution over both the parameters and the data. And that is composed as a composition of a distribution on the parameters that's called the prior and a what is called a probability kernel or a model or a likelihood that describes the distribution of the data for every possible parameter setting. So that's the Bayesian statistical setting. Your assumptions about what is more typical a priori, that's in the prior. Your assumptions about how the structure of the world gives rise to the statistical distribution of data, that's another body of assumptions. And the second key idea in probabilistic inference is, well, it's not so much a key idea, but it is a consequence of having made this choice to model parameters not as unknown constants, but rather as random variables. The second key idea is that in Bayesian inference, statistical inference is carried out by ordinary probabilistic conditioning. So I have a joint distribution. I have some particular realization of data x. And then I'm interested in this conditional distribution, which is called the posterior in Bayesian analysis. Now you combine these two bodies of ideas. The idea is we're going to express our statistical assumptions with programs that generate samples. So we're going to represent this object here, the joint distribution by program. And then we're going to use generic algorithms for performing probabilistic conditioning in order to get at this object, which is what we're interested in, so the posterior distribution. So just uh, some warm up here. So this is a very simple probabilistic Python program. Uh, there's not actually a, I mean, maybe there is a Python probabilistic programming language, but I like using Python because everyone speaks it. Uh, the language I was uh, involved in producing bases on Lisp. It's based on Lisp, and everyone hates Lisp unless they love Lisp. And that's a very small set of people. So, <clears throat> so here's a, here's a, <laughs> yeah. So here's a very simple Python program. It takes two inputs, N and P, and it evidently it calls this procedure Bernoulli, which I'll just tell you right now. So this, when you call it with uh, a real number between 0 and 1, that, f that generates a 0 or 1, a 1 with probability P. So I, and form formally, I might talk about flipping a coin with bias P. It does this, it does this N times. So it's going to produce a list of N Bernoulli random variables, and then it's going to take the sum. So this is just the binomial representation. So on the surface, it, it generates a random integer. So that's maybe its type. Uh, but it also defines a family of distributions on the, the set 0 up to n, uh, the, in particular the binomial family. And then finally, from this Bayesian perspective, it is, a, is, is perhaps a, a statistical model, so a kernel, probability kernel, uh, describing, for example, the number of successes among n independent and identical experiments, each kind of succeeding with probability p. Okay. And then the inferential problem is, well, 
I might model, like, like I was intimating, a randomized trial by a pair of binomial experiments. There's some control group and some treatment group. Now, I don't know what the success of the treatment is, or I don't know, that say, the, the, the probability that uh, an individual re will recover from their disease if they're in the control group or in the treatment group, but I can model those. I can model my uncertainty with distribution. So here, I'm here. Uniform is meant to stand for some kind of statement of complete uncertainty as to what these parameters might have might be. And so I can. And so then, the, the composition of these two procedures is a Bayesian model of a randomized trial. Uh, but it's also, it's not just math, I can run it. So I can evaluate this program, I might get a pair of numbers, 71 and 9. Now inside the program, in the, in the course of generating 71 and 9, I generated also P control and P treatment. And so I can look backwards at, you know, because I ran this code, so I know what the numbers were, and the numbers were 0.67 and 0.86. Now, what we'd like to that, so that's not the actual problem we face. The actual problem we face is someone tells us 71 and 9. And we, don't, we didn't generate that. Someone else did. But we're then going to use this model to try to look backwards and ask, well, what were the likely values of P control and P treatment? And that is inference. And in this particular case, it would be represented uh, uh, exactly by a pair of distributions, one for P control, one for P treatment. That's because of independence. All right, so that's the inference problem. And the way we'll formalize it is we'll define something called the stochastic inference problem. So the input in this problem is a pair of programs. One we'll call the guesser, and one we'll call the checker. They're both programs. They might consume randomness in, in their evaluation. And the output that you must produce in order to solve this problem is a sample from the same distribution as that produced by this program. So this program's is a while loop. It starts off by making a guess the first time around, by evaluating the guesser program. One of, this is one of the inputs, recall. So we run one of the programs you, give, you have given, given this uh, program. And then we take that guess, and we hand it over to the checker. The checker is Boolean valued. So we, we uh, write that to this variable accept. And then we repeat this loop over and over and over until we get a guess that is accepted by the checker. And then that guess that was accepted, that's the output of this program. So this is a computation that captures Bayesian statistical yes, inference. Rejection sampling? This is exactly rejection sampling. Or guess and check. What are you inferring here? So to translate into Bayesian statistical terms, guesser is your prior. The likelihood of a particular guess is a probability that checker, when handed that particular value, returns true. And the posterior distribution is precisely the distribution of the return value at this point in the program. So this, this is a computation that conditions a distribution. All right, so I have a few examples now following this to give you some intuition. So for example, let's consider a simple problem of inferring the bias of a coin from a few observations of that coin being tossed. So again, we have our program representing the stochastic inference problem. And uh, say in math, we're given some sequence of uh, binary values. They've been generated by some random process that has some bias, it's not, say, probability one half of getting at zero one, it's something else. <coughs> We'd like to report a probability of, say, the next element being one. So that's an inference about the bias of the coin, assuming they're independent. So in this case, we would model this or solve it using the stochastic inference problem, or pose it as a stochastic inference problem with a guesser of the form that returns a uniform random variable, say, in the unit interval. So this is from, a, say, a Bayesian subjective Bayesian perspective, this would be a statement of a complete uncertainty as to what the bias might be. And then the checker, what does the checker do? Well, this is my data, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So I'm going to go ahead and generate. I'm going to, this is, this uh, notation here means generate five Bernoullis and put them in a list. 
I had different notation for that a few slides ago, but imagine I had this simpler notation. All right, so this is going to generate five Bernoullis, put them, put them in a list, and then I'm going to, the checker is going to accept exactly when this simulation generates the data that I actually have in hand. Do you need the, <coughs> sorry, do you need the guesser to be uh, probabilistic, or uh, can you set the p to one value between zero and one? Well, in order for this to implement Bayesian inference, it has to be random. Otherwise, so imagine guesser is not random. Then uh, the output of this program will just be whatever non-random thing you put here. So get, if, if guesser is non-random, then you know what guess is going to be. So there's not really any inference being carried out. Well, if you have a very strong prior, you know the answer, then the Bayesian inference will not change yeah. your mind, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's not fat I mean, it's it's unusual, it's not disallowed, right? And indeed, in the limit, so one thing to, one thing to mention is, all right, well, actually, let me not get sidetracked quite yet. <laughs> it's early, early on in the talk. Does that represent the pi or uh, p? Uh, guesser represents the prior. So I can choose my prior. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can be certain. You can be certain it's 1 half. And then nothing here will convince you. And indeed, the choice 1 half has probability, uh, positive probability of generating any potential so string. So you will eventually exit this loop, and you will report one half, and you will be so your. You cannot update my prior. That is what it is. If I choose that's right. in the guesser, uh, I'm committed to it. Uh, that's it right. That's right. And if it's incompatible, there will be a fixed point. It's called the confirmation bias. It's, it's, <laughs> it's updated into itself. All right. I'm, I'm Good questions, though. Confused. You report, you're supposed to report the probability. That no, no. Oh, oh, sorry. Are you asking about report probability? Yeah. No, no not that probability. That one is a red herring. It's, it's, that's, that's a number. It's not, uh, it's not interesting that it's a probability. Uh, but you need to report the probability that you're, the definition of probability, that, that you're, the, this is the right para parameter for, that, for the observed data. So right, so. To, re to report the probability that the, I mean, the probability distribution that you showed us. OK, yeah, so, so, so this is a key point, and maybe a key difference between probabilistic programming and uh, probabilistic databases, say. Okay, or, I'm, I'm just cu uh, curious about this example. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're returning a probability distribution of Lumpy here, right? That's what you were saying. This, this program, with these two definitions, this program represents the distribution you're talking about. Do you need to repeat it? Into, uh, I don't need to repeat anything. It, that code, this piece of code, represents the distribution. That is, that is a representation. Now, you might ask, what can you do with the representation of a distribution that produces samples? Okay? And evidently, you can condition them. You can run them, things like that. So, so one question that I'm very interested in and we have worked with, say, Cameron and Nate and, and various other people is what precisely can you do with distributions represented by code? One thing you can do is run them, for example. But you can also compo compose them with other distributions to, 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 uh, to affect those distributions, for example, to condition them. Okay. Just no, no, no. So, but I can substitute p with beta 2, 1, for instance. You mean you can substitute uniform? Yeah, you could do anything you, do, you can do here. Complete freedom. Sure, but yeah. how beta 2, 1 represent my prior? Yes. That would, will be updated uh, with the number of uh, Indeed, and one that I observe. Right, so yeah, so if you start with beta 2, 1 here, then you'll end up, this will end up being a representation of a beta 3, Two, three, four, five. Beta three, five distribution, right? Yeah. Okay, great. But All right. I think it's an interesting point. So, I mean, so what Marco just said, and what you, what you say, these are different techniques. So you're, you're kind of estimating the outcome that we can compute symbolically by hand on, on the sign. Yeah, but I think it would be uniform because it's beta one, one. Uh, so. I mean, I, I chose uniform here so that, because not everyone in the audience will know what I mean when I write beta. Uh, but I don't think, this is not about, this is not about estimation yet, I don't think. No. Yeah. No. 
Maybe I, I'd like to understand your point, so maybe you can just say it again differently. So the point is, if you use uniform or beta something something, yeah. then there's a, there's a symbolic, there's a computer algebra system ah. on the back of this that will make all this obsolete and you can compute directly the answer on yeah. the nodes. Yeah, so in that particular case, yes. But here you can put anything, and yeah. this, is, this is just something. And I, there's this dichotomy, right, between what you can compute by pen and paper symbolically yes. and this type of thing, which is completely generic. Yes. Yeah. I'm very interested in that gap. But you can see that's a, a compilation technique to embed to interpret part of the code and optimize this symbolically. Yeah. Well, then not for all code, though. Not, not for all code. code. Yeah. For the, but most of the time, you can't do anything. Right. Yeah. 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 But if you discover a pattern, then you know that you can replace it. Right. That's right. what uh, Fred's algorithm tried to do, right? Well, I, so, so it's interesting. You could think about inference as program analysis, like say, symbolically realizing that this program with these two inputs will now be a beta 2, 4, or 5, beta 2, 5. Um, but that's not how inference is going to work. So we'll see. And, and, and I, well, that's too strong of a statement. Uh, in, in the simple story, program analysis and compiler people sweep in and solve all the hard problems. Like, for example, recognizing, compiling this down and realizing it's a beta 2.5. Um, but I get, anyways, we'll, 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 you'll, you'll hear my opinion on that later. All right, so if I run this program, so now, so, so this is, if I run this program, say, 10 times, and I generate, I plot the histogram, I get this. If I run it 50 times or uh, 10,000 times, so, so this, this is converging. You can make that precise. And it's converging exactly to the, what would be, if I were to give a formal semantics to this language, it's converging exactly to what would be the denotation of this program. Right, so that's what I mean. And so this is a beta 2.5 distribution, if you want to know what a beta 2.5 looks like. Okay. So that, Clear? All right. All right, so if this is what we were going to do with probabilistic programming, no one would care. So uh, we're interested in more interesting things. And indeed, given the flexibility of this interface, uh, so sort of the sky is the limit. So here's a slightly more interesting question, a little visual. So how many objects are in this image? All right, there's one object. It seems reasonable to say, say there's one object. How about here? So how many objects are in this image? A little bit of uncertainty, maybe. Even if I told you all objects are rectangular and have a single color, you know, how many objects are here? Right? It's, a little, it's not clear. And if I were to say, move the, uh, I think that's green, out of the way and show you that, you might be surprised. You'd be like, ah, you got me. All right? So how, how, how could we build a Bayesian model that would say reason, about, reason in this situation and answer a question like, how many objects are in this image? So what's, our, what's a guesser, and what, how do we frame this as a, as a stochastic inference problem? Well, so we need some model of the structure underlying an image. Because right, that's the question we're after, how many images? So indeed, we make a guess. We have some distribution here, geometric. Geometric is a distribution on the integers, kind of gets increasingly unlikely. So it's most likely is 0, then 1, then 2, et cetera. And then, from this number of blocks, we generate blocks. So we have, I, have, I wrote some simple code to generate a random block. Basically cho chose a pair of coordinates at random. And I chose a color from four colors at random. All right, so very simple model. What is the range, the size? What are these, the sizes? What is K? Yeah, the range. You say you generate a block. So K is the number of blocks. I'm, I'm making here a model of an image. K blocks, yeah. I generate K blocks. Blocks are random. Blocks are going to, well, uh, in my model, I don't know where the blocks are, so this is a statement of uncertainty as to the location of blocks, yeah. subjectively. But then, yeah, I'm generating random blocks. All right, so th then my guess is going to be this triple. How many blocks, their location, and their color? And then what's my checker if I want to understand this image? Well, I'm going to rasterize. So I wrote a, s a simple piece of code. I actually did this last, like, <laughs> last couple nights, which is why I, yeah. Anyway, so. Um, I wrote code to rasterize this collection of variables so to produce an image exactly like this. And then I'm going to test that it's exactly the same image. How does the rasterizer handle overlapping blocks? There's an order implicit in this list and assumed to be front to back. 
Any questions? All right. All right, so uh, when you run Guesser, you, what do you get? And if you, ra if you rasterize the outputs produced by Guesser, what do you get? So this is, this is a particular image. I don't know how many blocks that there are here, because not really, I'm not only revealing to you the image. But here are some, here are some images produced by, um, by Guesser. And if I run it on this particular, if I run, the, if I run this program, if I tr view this as a stochastic inference problem, then I can run it. I can run this multiple times in order to start to get a picture of what this distribution looks like, what this code, what what the denotation of this code is, right? And here's a here's a hundred runs. So this model believes there are two objects here, and it's possible there are three, but it's much less likely. And what we're going towards here is say. Can you explain the four? What's the interpretation six. of the four, or even six blocks? Oh, well, I mean, it could be a one, size one block here, another one here. There could be all sorts of nonsense going on behind that block. We don't get to see. Yeah. Zero and one are just impossible. Zero and one are impossible, which is why, thank you. That's a great point to make, yeah. So these are impossible. And this is just due to Monte Carlo noise. I don't have a perfect picture here yet of the distribution. But this is a perfect representation of the distribution, the code. <coughs> So this leads us to uh, what you might call a fantasy example. So can we extract the 3D structure from an image? I show you an image, right? I'm looking at Dan, and I have I can kind of I I can I know there's the back of your head. I know that you're not a. I can estimate how you're sitting, and I could, you know, I I know I can uh, I, I have a sense of the shape of the room, even though I'm looking at a two-dimensional image, right? That's kind of amazing. There's a lot of uncertainty going on there. It's a problem the mind solves regularly. So how could it be represented as a stochastic inference problem? Well, the guesser might, well, what would the guesser have to have? It would have to have some model of three-dimensional structure. So um, for example, it could. Model of Dan? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a model of three-dimensional structures, which includes Dan. So I didn't want to get into the details, but how could you generate a random three-dimensional structure? And this is chosen mostly to be easy to describe in front, of, in front of an audience. But I can imagine like getting a bunch of spheres that are overlapping in some way and then shrink wrapping a mesh around it. No one's actually done that. I've just, I use that because it's intuitive. And you can believe me that I could actually write a program that does that. But now I, I have a guesser, which guesses a three-dimensional shape. And what would the checker do? The checker would render it, maybe put it on top of a fuzzy background. And then if you had an actual image, it might do a pixel-wise comparison. Now, if you demand that the pixels be equivalent, it's never going to succeed, or it would be extremely rare. And, you'd, and, uh, and so what you do, and this is typical, you, you, you allow a little bit of slack. So that's the Ford problem. And then the reverse problem, I show you an actual image. I run, and then the stochastic inference problem, this program represents a distribution on structures. And depending on the way the, the structure of the guesser, I would expect this distribution over structures to accurately capture things I know as a human might be true, for, or or I might not. Like for example, if I was just willy-nilly throwing down spheres, merging them to get, and then shrink, merging them together, then shrink wrapping a mesh around them, there's nothing inherent about symmetry. So if you saw a picture of me from the side, you wouldn't. The, the process would invent structure to explain the hand that you see, but it wouldn't invent any structure to explain the arm you didn't. Right? Because I haven't I haven't I haven't insisted that the model have any notion of symmetry. But I could build that in. My model for my model for three, three dimensional structures said could posit some symmetry. Right. And if it's not there, I shouldn't expect it to model that. All right, so I write fantasy here, but uh, actually this has been realized. So uh, um, Vikash Mansinka, who uh, is just over there, has a group at MIT, and they've used precisely this idea of generative vision to look at, for example, images of humans and to estimate the pose. And against certain baselines, um, this blows that away. And so what is the generative model? So it's a little bit more restrictive. There's a, there's a posable human shape. What is the guess? The guess is the pose, joint angles, et cetera. The checker is comparing, in some sense, that three-dimensional structure against the actual image. 
Yeah. Are you going to tell us some runtime for this? Uh, yeah, you can ask the next speaker that. All right. But yeah, but, but that gets that gets at the problem. I mean, actually, I think I actually I think this is reasonably f efficient. Actually. Oh, so maybe may, something something I haven't really gotten into is this is not a serious proposal for an algorithm. Recall at the beginning that all I've said is that this is this is. This, this is a program describing the, a dis, the distribution, which you are responsible if you're trying to solve the stochastic inference problem. It's your job to produce a sample from this distribution, but you don't have to do it this way. You just have to sample from this distribution, so or a sample approximately. It's a mathematical description of it. Yes, it's a mathematical code description of the, of the problem you're faced with, but you don't have to run this code. Are you going to show us how you do it? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> All right. So uh, a few other things about probabilistic. Just explain the, the three columns there. I didn't quite understand. Observe baseline and picture. This is the actual picture handed to the system, and I'm, uh, this is the actual picture handed to the system. This is a pose estimated by the technique they're comparing against. Um, so you can see a slight blue line here. So the, the baseline method has indeed found the left leg, and here's its torso. Here's the head. So this is a a reasonable example. Um, but you can see that the baseline has problems in some situations. Like, What is the picture? This is a football player. No, no. You have three quarters. You have three picture. 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 What is the oh, picture? Picture, sorry, is the name of the system that does generative vision. Ah, this so this is the pose estimated it that it infers. Ah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, that was unclear. But anyways, these, the, these look very good. Uh, so a, a, a couple uh, observations about probabilistic programs or programs that represent distribution. So here's, a, here's again, a very, very simple program, geometric, takes in a probability. It, te it, it generates a Bernoulli random variable, flips a coin. With probability p, it stops and returns 0. Otherwise, it, it calls itself and then adds 1 to the result. So I used geometric already. Geometric was the distribution that I used to choose the number of random blocks. Uh, so this piece of code represents a geometric distribution with this particular mean. Uh, but note, when I run this program, there is a probability zero path to infinity, where I keep, say, generating a zero. Right? So there's no finite bound on the number of recursions that this program can, can make. And what's going on here is that this, this program, viewed as a function and then in and then kind of we, when we view that, that, that function uh, and say the framework of computable analysis, what we have is that this, what we're describing here is a sampler that is not computable in the, in the normal sense, so not total computable, but rather almost everywhere computable. Uh, and, and precisely this ability to uh, run forever is, is the reason why this probabilistic programming approach allows you to, say, describe open world probabilistic models. Uh, and this is folklore. It appears in a number of papers. We, we have a, a, a proof of it, but certainly not our result. But the set of distributions for which there are AE computable samplers is a strict superset of the, the set of distributions for which there is a, a computable. And the easiest example, I think Cameron even brought it up already. If I give you a source of one half, bias one half fair coins, and I ask you to generate a one third coin, you can do that, but you can prove there's always one, at least one path through your program that doesn't halt. It's a measure zero path, but right. so this is just a curiosity. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so, so this is it. So now I've taken that guesser and checker stochastic inference problem code. I've wrapped it inside a procedure, so now I have something I can talk about, condition. So condition, this, this, this piece of code here represents the higher order operation of conditioning. So when, if, I, if I kind of restrict to, just, just for simplicity, if I, if I restrict to the case where the checker function is deterministic, so does that mean it takes an input and returns true or false? So I can think about checker as a characteristic function of a set. It, te it tells you, are you in the set or out of the set? Impl that's what's going on. So what is condition doing? It's taking in guesser. Guesser is representing a probability distribution, p. It's taking in a deterministic checker, say. That's representing the indicator function for some set, a. And what is the output of condition? It is that condition distribution. So it is a, you know, given by this ratio. 
but what we're conditioning on A is being determined by the predicate. And this works provided that the probability of the set that you're trying to condition on is positive. All right, so I mentioned this earlier. Condition is not a proposal for an algorithm. But we could, we can, and, and then as I said earlier, this defines what the stochastic inference problem is. It, 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 it's, it defines the operation that we care about. Uh, but even though it's not a serious proposal for an algorithm, we can ask, like, well, how efficient is this algorithm? So if we let, say, model be uh, a, a program representing some distribution P, so I'm, I'm going to get away from guesser and check, but some, the model here is, kind of, is a guesser. And then I say I have some deterministic predicate um, for some set A. Then it's, it's uh, elementary to, to, to uh, work out that in expectation the num th that the evaluation of conditioning a model on a, on a term deterministic predicate, this is going to take in expectation one over pr the probability of the, s the set A that you're, the predicate is representing times as long as running the predicate itself on the model. Because what's going on there is we just have a geometric situation. We have, an, we have independent trials. Each time we're making guess and, and checking it. So it's an independent trial. It might succeed or fa fail. And we're talking about how soon until the first success. That's a geometric random variable. And so if the predicate model is efficient, if, that, if this, if this uh, term is efficient to run in some sense, you have to, you have to, it's, it's, I'll talk a little bit later about notions of efficiency of random s samplers. You know, it's not going to be polynomial time in the strict sense. I'll, I'll talk about that. And if the probability of the set A, so if the, in some sense the checker is checking against data, so this is something like the probability of the data. So if, if, the, if, if the data is not too unlikely, then actually this will, this will be a, a, an efficient representation. But in the typical situation where you have a lot of data, and when you have a lot of data, unless unless it's almost certain what the data is going to be, if you have a lot of data, then it's going to be extremely unlikely PA is going to be exponentially small in some natural parameter, and then this won't be an efficient algorithm. Margo? Take, uh, take example from before, the one, uh, for instance, from the coin, uh, on the coin. Um, the event A is uh, observing one coin or uh, observing the history of coins? So in the checker, for the coin example, it was not deterministic. But if you wanted to make it deterministic, then you would move all that randomness into the guesser. So the guesser would guess a coin and generate, say, five hypothesized coins. And the checker would just check to see if those, so, so guesser, the checker is now take, getting in a pair. It's getting in a probability value and a list of five elements. And it's checking to see if that list of five elements is equal to its particular, the particular list that, it, that is the data. Does that answer your question? OK. And generally, you can always do that transformation, obviously. All right, so, so if condition is not a serious proposal for an algorithm, then what, is, what are we doing in probabilistic programming? So, so, so state-of-the-art algorithms are doing something like what's described here. And, a, and at a high level, they're performing a random walk. So it's a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. They're performing a random walk. In what space are they performing a random walk? They're performing a random walk in the space of possible ways the program could have run. So when you run the program, it makes random choices. It's, you can trace those random choices and create a data structure representing capturing the way that the program ran. So that's a, you can think about that as a point in an abstract space of traces or ways the program could have run. And then we're going to perform a random walk in this space constrained to be among those ways the program could have run that, uh, that agree with the data. So in code, so we had a model. That was our guesser. Well, I'm going to reify it. So model is now what, what you call guesser before? Model is what I call guesser before. Okay. So you had a, you had a model. I'm going to now introduce our model, which is the uh, R for reified. So model had randomness inside of it. Our model has no randomness. It takes all its randomness as input. Okay, makes sense. So now I get to control it from outside. That's what I need. And then I have some operation that acts on randomness that leaves the randomness invariant. So I have a way to perturb in a measure-preserving way my randomness. right? And then technically, I want this perturbation operation to be ergodic with respect to this distribution. And then how does this, how does this approach work at a very, very high level? I start off with some 
choice of randomness. All right, and then n times, I'm going to perturb that randomness, and then I'm going to run my model on that randomness. That's like running guesser, okay, or, or running model. I'm going to check it against the predicate. And if, it, if it's true, I'm going to update my entropy. So I've ta I have, I'm at some current choice of ran random input. I perturb it, and I accept that perturbation if the data are still satisfied. Yeah? How do you find the initial that did that? Yeah, so that's, that is, so there's, there's two answers to that question. One is, uh, maybe it's not our problem, all right? Uh, and so you give me an initial value for entropy, which is not actually random, but that satisfies the, the constraint. Another way, and actually the way that it works in, pro in practice, and this relates to some comput computability results, but also it's just, you have a SAT problem otherwise. Um, you uh, don't have hard constraints. So instead of, for example, conditioning on the realization of a Gaussian being zero, because that's even impossible, or say, rather than conditioning on the realization of a geometric being four, just charge me the probability of generating that four. Okay? And that will be a function of, the, the, say, the, the, the probability parameter for the geometric. And maybe that's the output of my program. So if, if the output of my program is that probability that I'm feeding into a geometric and I have to generate a four, then rather than having the hard constraint, have the soft one. And then this is always possible. And then this equals true gets relaxed to something else called the accept kind of accept reject step in the Metropolis Hastings. Okay. So uh, so a brief word. Just go into a bit more de detail about this, how this perturb works in practice. Because you could do this in, in a very generic way. Like random here could be literally a uniformly distributed random element in the unit interval. Perturb could be some er ergodic trans uh, transformation, leaving it invariant. And this would, in principle, work. Uh, but we have all this information about the structure of a program. You've given me the code. It tells me quite a bit about the structure of the program, something like, something like in a, in a way that you can formalize, giving me the, a graphical model. But it also has conditional independence. It also has local independence information. So it's richer, even. All right, so to understand perturbs, we have to talk a bit more about traces. So traces, as I was talking about, are these structures that keep track of the way that the program has unfolded. So it's a tree data structure capturing the random choices that have been encountered in the evaluation of the program. And it, uniquely determines the path that was taken by the interpreter while eva evaluating the program. So it has, looks, so it looks something like that. That's a funny way of saying it. So this, here's, here's, a, here's a depiction of a trace. Uh, and, and, and this is rather informal, but uh, I, can, I think about them have, having two key parts. There are parts of the trace which are just about control flow and the program evaluating. This is re representing the recursive structure of an interpretation of, say, of a functional language. And then there are these points in the program where you actually encounter randomness. And these are the interesting ones, in some sense. These are points in the program where you actually encounter randomness. So this represents, say, the evaluation of the Bernoulli procedure. And this is just that Bernoulli proceed, that the value of that Bernoulli flowing up in an if statement. And this, say, control flow here is, well, if the Bernoulli is 1 or 0, then that will affect which branch of the if statement I take. Okay. So, the trace is determined by the values of these random primitives. So if I tell you the value of this and the value of this, and that actually tells me this straight structure, I know it. And changes to these primitives. So if I were to modify this value here, then it might cause the program to evaluate in a different way. So how perturb is going to work, how we're going to move around in the space, is we're going to reconsider random choices. And those by reconsidering random choices, that will have follow-on effects and cause us to take program paths we didn't take before, potentially. So that's going to be the source of, that's going to be our Markov kernel that's going to generate a Markov chain. So yeah. this means that you need to unfold the entire program or the yes. iterations. And yes. Huge yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, need is a strong word. That's how the first algorithms worked. But if you proceed this whole step with the program analysis, Maybe you collapse most of the program to some simpler computation and then only unfold that. Yeah. So, um, you need to um, 
somehow you need to control the uh, uh, willingness of the code to go into infinite branches. And you have this, this kind of entropic explosion of traces of length n, yeah. which can be used super large. Yeah. So you need to tell the program, do not get too deep into, else you'll go, you know, you'll never be a goddick. So the, so there's two things. So one, if this was the only, if this was a Markov chain, actually, then yeah, that would be a problem. Uh, but it's this, I haven't yet described the full Markov chain. The program itself does not have that explosion because the program itself halts with probability one. And so it, it is self-controlled. It, it, it cannot have a positive probability of an explosion or that will result not in a probability measure but a sub-probability measure. Actually, so the, the graph is not fixed. They're random, they're random bits. Yes, Why? absolutely. The graph to grow, to grow. Yeah, for example, this, the, this if branch here is just some simple computation, but you can imagine a huge computation flowing, flowing off the bottom of this. And so depending on which of the particular branches you took, you'd have one or two, well, you'd have a, a sample from a distribution over subtraces here and, or a sample of distributions over subtraces there. So you need to, lay, to expand this lazily, otherwise it's an, infinite, it's an infinite. Oh, yes. This structure is not produced all at once. It is you, you, uh, the trace represents how you actually ran, not the set of all possible. Yeah, and that's critical. And that's really, actually, that idea was already in Blog. Blog has a similar notion of trace um, uh, and, and the idea that you, have, you, you kind of only instantiate the variables that are being talked about. And that's kind of analogous to this, even if different, different in its details. But that same idea is, was necessary, say, for Blog to work, yeah. Determination with probability one is something you enforce or something you require? You can't, I mean, yeah, you can't enforce it by condition or check because it's no, undecidable. Uh, you can uh, guarantee it. You say, say that again? By program, some program analysis, you can guarantee a sound. There, there could be a sound but incomplete program analysis. But, but for that reason, because of the incompleteness, we just say it's your problem. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, I mean, people might think differently, but that's definitely my philosophy. Okay. Sorry, but you could have a termination of probably one and yet have like a, you know, a infinite mean time of return or yes. stuff like this. Yes. But that's, again, that's sort of the programmer's problem. If you create for me uh, a probabilistic model whose latent structures are infinite in size and expectation, that's what you're asking me to do. I don't have any recourse. That's what you're asking me to do. Okay. So, so I'm going to, so, I'm now going to give you an animation, kind of going in more detail. Oh, someone over here want to have, oh, yes. Hello. Uh, I was just going to say, um, uh, it's also worth noting that there are two approaches being taken in the field. One, which is kind of more like Prolog, a declarative model, where you just have to con implicitly control all these issues by changing how you write the model. And then there's other languages which actually give you control over the Markov chain doing inference or give you alternatives to the Markov chain altogether, more like an interactive theorem prover with a tactics language. So it's important to remember both models exist. So you, you get to s program your, your run the more traces, so to speak, explicitly. That's right, or, or even use a different type of inference strategy. Like uh, we're going to have a speaker from Oxford, I think, who'll be talking about variational inference, uh, which is like a different a different strategy for approximating the, the same basic problem. Yeah, so as I said in the, in the beginning, this is, a, this is the simple part of the story where I'm not showing any, <laughs> any of the discord, maybe. And, uh, and uh, in the complicated version of the story, I think it's necessary to go beyond assuming that we're going to have one algorithm that solves all of our problems. That sounds obvious, because it is. All right, so. So here, we're back to the geometric program. I'm going to give you a bit more detail about how this trace MCMC works. Here's a geometric program. It's going to sample for me a random integer. And, it's, and it has a potential uh, infinite path. And now, now what I've added onto is a, an additional computation. This is going to call geometric. And it, this is representing the computation associated with uh, checking that the geometric has a value less, circularly less than 3. Okay? So it's going to be 0, 1, or 2. And so I'm going to represent for you the trace associated with evaluating uh, uh, expression alias geometric for some particular value p. 
Right? So uh, uh, I guess this would be probably the second element in the trace, not the first one. But say we're evaluating, uh, evalu say we're tracing the evaluation of this procedure, right? Then the recursive evaluation that is interpretation will start creating this data structure. And right here is the first point where randomness is entered. Now that that Bernoulli is a, in the predicate of an if, and so here is the computation associated with figuring out which branch of the if we're going to take. All right, and then this here represents the, the, the fact that there was a potential for taking the other branch, but we didn't. All right, so this is the first kind of point where there's some structural randomness associated with the probabilistic program. We did not take this path. Instead, we created another recursive valuation of, of geometric. We're going to get some randomness again. And he, here, evidently, we do take that first path. And so the recursion will bottom out. And now we're going to run this alias computation in order to check our condition and see if our ge geometric random variable is actually less than three. In this particular case, it is. So this is a trace. And there's two elements of randomness, that, in particular, the two calls of Bernoulli. And if I tell you these two values, then the rest of it is a deterministic function. So this is really, this, this, is, this is, in some sense, this is one way to name the structure. So I don't really have to store this whole thing if I don't want to. I could just say store these two random values. All right, so I'm going to collapse this huge picture, which causes my LaTeX to compile very slowly, into this one. All right, so I'm just highlighting the two random choices. And, and for this particular model, the number of random, cho random choices I make exactly tells you the, the value of the geometric that I produced. So there's two geometrics, and so the value of the geometric was 2. And the probability that I arrived at this trace is p times 1 minus p. Now, another evaluation I could have gotten is where it immediately halted and returned 1. And that would be a trace that had this type of structure. Basically, this, this part would not have been like this. This would not have been there. Or I could have sampled three, and or so on. Right, we know from you know, analyzing these, this, this model in you know, elementary probability class, that here is our distribution <coughs> of a geometric for generic K. And this computation that's represented by this part of the trace, which tests whether the geometric is strictly less than three, that computation returns true for only these two traces. So to sample from this distribution, I have to sample from among these two structures. And I should sample this one with probability proportional to p. And I should sample this one with probability proportional to p times 1 minus p. Okay, and inst instead of saying 1 minus p, I'm going to say p bar. Okay, so p times p bar. So. So proportional to, that's going to end up being, well, it better be p over p plus p times p bar. That's the probability I sample 1 or under, the, under this condition distribution or, uh, versus this. Okay, so these two sum up to 1. So that's the actual distribution that we're after. So recall that what we're going to do is we're going to reconsider these random choices. That's going to be our proposal, but not quite. So here is a list of all the possible traces. I stopped drawing them after three. And there's not six of them. There's an infinite number of them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe to you a Markov transition probability that moves. So there's going to be some probability that if you're here, you move here, or stay there, or move here, etc. So I have to describe to you these probabilities. And the goal is, why am I describing a transition? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this transition. Then I'm going to take it again, and take it again, and take it again. And if I take it many, many, many times, this Markov chain will tend to be in some states more often than others. And I've succeeded if, when I run this chain many, many, many times, I'm in this state with this probability, and I'm in this state with this probability. So that's success. Yeah. Never allowed to, uh, yourself to get out of accept, accept, accepting states. Well, I mean, you have to define an ocean convergence, so the chain I'm going to describe won't spend any time <coughs> over here. Okay, but uh, it might be reasonable actually to allow your chain to spend some. Uh, well, actually, the, the the type of algorithm I'm describing, you just cannot be out here that's because well, and, and that's because it's stationary. But you can imagine something that's not stationary but still ha is converging. 
that could be interesting. I don't think anyone's working on things like that, but it could be interesting. OK. So I'm going to describe this Markov transition in two stages. First is going to be a proposal, and then we're going to fix the proposal in some sense. So the proposal is what I described earlier. If I'm at this, if I'm at this current state, I'm going to propose to reconsider this random choice. So this Bernoulli evidently came up 1. That's why I halted. So I'm going to say, oh, let's, turn you, let's, let's modify that Bernoulli and change it to a 0. So what, the, what happens now? Well, I change that Bernoulli to 0. So now the interpreter says, oh, there's, there's part of the program that I should have run. So it starts running it. What is that? It starts running a geometric. So that geometric might halt after one step, two steps, or k steps. So this is a transition. And these are the transition probabilities. All right? Now what if I'm over here? Well, now there are two choices I could have chosen. So I'm going to choose, I'm going to, choose to either change my mind here or change my mind here with equal probability. So if I change my mind here, before I did a recursion, if I change my mind, that means I don't do recursion. So I move to this state. And I move with probably 1 half because I chose to reconsider this choice of 1 half. Or I could have chosen to reconsider this choice, which would then cause me to start a new evaluation of a geometric. And I could halt in one step, two steps, or k steps. Okay, so there's an infinite number of paths. Now comes the correction part. Basically, Metropolis Hastings tells me precisely how to, in, in, a way, in, in a way that I can mechanically compute from the program specification, a way to correct these, th this proposal. So it turns out that for the proposal starting from this state, I need to, um, if I move, ever move down here to 3 or larger, I actually reject it and move right back. So I started here. I made a proposal to something that's impossible under the distribution, and I immediately reject it. Now, this proposal sometimes moves to 2, or th this proposal also moves to 2. Th and this time, I don't reject it outright. Sometimes I, reject, sometimes I keep it, and sometimes I reject it. And then, here, if I'm starting here, if I happen to make a move here, then I always accept that move. And if I happen to make a move outside of the acceptable region, so not 1 or 2, then it's always rejected as well. And then you can collapse these probabilities, multiply and sum, and you get this transition probability. So this is the actual kernel being implemented. You can collect these probabilities up into a matrix. This is a Markov transition matrix. You raise it to the kth power. This, is, this, is, this tells you how does the system evolve after k steps. And then if you take the number of steps to infinity, indeed, it converges to this collection of probabilities, which tells you which is exactly these. So that's, that's how inference works in these systems. So by you have a program that has made random choices. You reevaluate those random choices, which may, moves you elsewhere. You either accept or reject that modification to the system in a precisely tuned way such that if you keep doing that operation of perturbing and rejecting or accepting the perturbation, you converge to the distribution of interest. Is the convergence rate something with eigenvalues? Uh, so yeah, yeah, you can analyze this. So typically, systems are. Uh, they need not even be, they need not be discrete. So, so you have to analyze it with, it's not just about like a finite system with a spectral gap. But you, uh, uh, in, practice, in practice, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, obviously. So, and by, by does work, I mean gives us useful answers in, in, in reasonable time. Uh, and the mathematics of analyzing Markov chains, as I'm not sure if Alistair is here, I mean, it's difficult. We're working on. We're typically writing down chains that that we're nowhere near as a community able to analyze theoretically. So there's not really much we can say in terms of guarantees. But uh, but yeah, this this works surprisingly well, or sometimes it doesn't, and that gets to the complicated part of the story. Yeah. Clear in the algorithm you explained to me uh, where uh, you use the program structure. Uh, of course, you used to generate the trace, but after that, do you look again to the program yes. structure? When I, when, I decide to, re, when I decide to reconsider this random choice, what's the, <coughs> the program is determining the probabilities that I move to these other states. So it's only in the proposal. It's in, you it, don't use it in the metropolis. Uh, use it there as well. This is also, this, these probabilities are also being determined by the program. Yep. And it's an interesting point, which gets, gets to the more complicated story. Different representations of the same distribution will, have a, will, will result in different chains. 
some which might be faster than others. And that's, I'd say that's not a pathology of this approach, but actually like maybe our only hope. Okay. All right, now for the real story. So uh, I don't have very much time, uh, but it's good. I had a lot of questions. I'm ho five minutes, thanks. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to touch upon a few things. So what I've just described, this algorithm that I just described, it requires a little bit of structure in the program uh, in order to compute these probabilities, actually. So this is actually not completely generic. You can't just put any probabilistic programming in the setting. Now, it's very, very weak, the assumptions that you need to put on here. It's something like, uh, well, it's really, it gets down to this slide. Just how generically can I say, take a, take a program representing a distribution on a pair of random variables, take a value for one of the random variables, and then produce a program that represents or samples from the conditional distribution, right? Just how generically can we perform that operation, right? So um, we've been talking about things that kind of feel discrete, or there were some uniform random variables, but there's, there's a way to, uh, to talk uh, very formally about representations for distributions in very complicated spaces, continuous distributions, mixtures of continuous and discrete. So this is, this is very general. So very complicated structures could flow in here. So just how generically can we perform this operation? And this is an essential summary. So if it's discrete, it's always possible, provided that this data is not impossible. And witness to this being possible is the accept reject, the rejection sampling algorithm. Okay? That's witness to the fact that this is possible. Never, not efficiently, but it's possible. But actually, if you, if, you, if you ask how generically can I perform this operation when the, the variable that you're conditioning on is, is continuous, that's not possible. That's what Cameron talked about a couple days ago, so that you can encode the halting problem into this. But if you add some noise to that observation, so rather than conditioning on x, you add some independent smooth noise, now it's, now it's possible again. And this is, this is an instance of a generic structure where you can have something arbitrarily complicated, and you can be conditioning on something continuous or just heinous, and what you really need is you need some variable s that separates the structure that you're conditioning on from the rest of the distribution. And you need to know a lot of information about this representation. So you need something called the conditional density. And if you have that conditional density, then you're good. So this is what allows us to do something like infinite dimensional Bayesian nonparametric statistics and still perform conditional inference. You, you were good already on the left, so what's different here? No, this is continuous. These are all continuous. So this is discrete. These are all continuous. So I, I can deal with continuous if I add no, smooth noise. And that's just a, that's a corollary of the fact that I can deal with continuous observations if I have a variable that separates the rest of the model from the observation and I know a conditional density. Okay. And you basically have something like a Bayes rule. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but this is a picture of the distribution that, is, that, that shows you that things are non-computable. And so if I, try to condition, if I try to sample from the conditional distribution given a particular ver on a vertical slice, that's not possible. But if I were to fuzz up this image by adding some noise, now it's possible. Uh, what about doing this operation efficiently? Well, of course, no. It's not even computable in general. But say if I restrict myself to the discrete case, it's certainly not efficient. We all know that. Uh, but there are structures, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go down this because I don't have time, but there are structures, there's, there's structure and distributions which gives us some leverage, like conditional independence. So what does conditional independence have to do with our MCMC algorithm? It, it's, it, there's no, it's not obvious that our conditional, our MCMC algorithm has, <coughs> takes advantage of conditional independence. It's certainly not as explicit as, say, a junction tree algorithm or variable elimination. But when you have a program that doesn't have very much conditional dependence, that's manifested by a very, very, very deep trace. And now those proposals that say, decide, say, I don't have anything marked as random here. But like for example, this whole structure could be produced because this value takes a value, this random variable takes a value one. So if I change that, now this structure disappears. And I have to generate it afresh. So these huge, long sequences of random choices that all depend on earlier things, now this simple procedure of reconsidering random choices is making wild and very unlikely proposals that are going to be typically rejected by the metropolis hastings acceptance rejection step. So when you don't have conditional independence, our algorithm tends to grind to a halt. Uh, so I just want to make this brief point because a lot of the talks previously have talked about the problem of inference being the one, one of computing probabilities. 
But there's a reason maybe to prefer the formulation of inference as a stochastic inference problem. So stochastic inference is about generating samples. And the reason why that might be a reasonable thing to do is because sampling is easier than computing probabilities. So you can, so if I have a distribution mu, say on strings, let's keep it simple, lexicographic order, so I start with the empty string, then 0, then 1, then 0, 0, 0, 1, et cetera. Let mu prime be the probability mass function. So this is the actual probability of the element x itself. So this is a distribution function, the cumulative distribution function. This is the probability mass function. So we'll call a distribution mu p computable if the distribution function is efficiently computable as a real function. I'm not going to go into how you can formalize that, but you can. And you can also talk about mu being p sampleable, which means that there's a Turing machine that generates samples efficiently. And you formalize that as you give the machine some desired accuracy, and the probability that it produces x and halts in time polynomial in the accuracy demand and the size of the value that it produces is very close to the probability mass function that you're trying to sample from. All right, so it's a natural definition coming from average p complexity. I can make criticisms of this definition um, in person later on, but there's, there's results uh, going back to the 90s, Ben David, Tor, Goldreich, and Lubby, and Yamakami. P computable is P sampleable if and only if P equals PP. So maybe we should be going after generating samples. You can do fun things with samples. You can compose them. Uh, Vikash's thesis is, is a great place to look about the power of s samplers in terms of their compositional structure. Um, and and uh, so. Yeah. Trying to just to parse this. Uh, so mu prime minus, OK, minus all this probability is, uh, is less than 2 to minus i. Yeah, for all x, for all i. Okay. So why is this, why, why do you care about the, why do you it's, uh, it's not, it's, this is the probability mass function. That, that's the probability of the distribution generating the value x. It's not, don't think about it as a, I mean, it is a difference. It is a derivative source, but this is exactly what you want. This is the probability, if I sample from mu, then mu prime of x is the probability that x shows up. Yeah, right. OK, I have to stop. OK, so uh, yeah, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Why the next speaker to be fair is when we have one, one question from the audience. Yes. So I have a question about the P, the, the Metropolis uh, Hastings thing. Yeah. Um, you don't. So, so the promise of the algorithm is that your sum, the, the the steady state of that Markov chain, is is the thing you you yes. want, right? Yeah. But you don't know what it is. That's right. So do I understand correctly that your generic procedure to evaluate the the, the Markov kernel on traces yep. does not actually uh, need to know what it's trying to convert to. Yes. And you can compute everything from the code? Yes. And efficiently. Iterations are efficient. What's potentially not efficient is the, the, uh, the convergence rate. Right, right. But still, it's, uh, it's interesting. All right, thank you.